your faithfulness, Lord, in bringing us together. You have done this. And you have done this, Lord, because it's your will. And we thank you, Lord, for the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. We once again bow before thee and worship thee. Lord, we specifically pray for Wellesley and Hannah as they are going to be joined together in a holy matrimony today. It's our prayer to God that you would bring forth your word unto us by the Holy Spirit. You reveal your will through your word. You create things in and through your word. Your word accomplishes everything. Lord, therefore we pray that you would speak to us this morning. Speak to your children. Speak to all of us. That this may be a time of hearing you. Even as Lord, it was shared to us. We are here to worship you. And in this gathering of worship, in this time together with you, these two lives may be joined together. That's our prayer, Lord. So we look up unto thee, O merciful God, O merciful God. That you would cause us to hear your voice. Beyond the words of man. That voice of the living God may be heard by all of us. Help us therefore. To exercise our spiritual faculties. For the natural man understandeth not the things of God. Father, I pray that you grant me words and expressions necessary. Grant me the anointing, Lord, as I yield myself to you, the Lordship of thy Holy Spirit. Every strength may be given both spiritual and natural, physical, to do thy will, even this morning. Worship thee, bless thee, and thank thee again. Lead us, Holy Spirit. We bow down before thee and worship you. And in Jesus' most precious and matchless name we pray. Amen. Dear Brother Wellesley and Sister Hannah, no. I want to share a few thoughts with us today. And those thoughts I prayerfully sought the Lord for. And I would like to say to you that God has laid this, these words upon my heart to share with you both. And it's a message centered on Christ, not on you. I don't know whether you like it or not. It's centered in Christ. And I know that that's what you really love. Many marriages, people talk about themselves and many, many other things. And saints of God who have gathered here in this hall perhaps in other halls, and maybe even online listening to us. I would like
to say to all of you and specifically to Wellesley and Hannah that every Christian wedding, every true wedding of a disciple or disciples of Christ, every wedding is a foretaste of the greatest wedding that will take place in the future. And that knowledge when Jesus will come to be one with his bride is very very precious. What I'm sharing with you today is not religion. What I'm sharing with you is something that is going to happen. And not only that, there is a great preparation going on today in the earth. But the scripture says in the book of Revelation, and I'm sure you all brought your Bibles, uh, and chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is a righteousness of the saints. Now this is very precious. Precious indeed. Because the scripture says, it's not only really that Christ is coming for the bride, but a bride has made herself ready. Amen? Amen. Now, if I ask her, Samson George, he has been running helter skelter all for the daughter's marriage. <laughs> A lot of preparation, isn't it, my dear brother? And if I ask Hannah, she will say, oh, uncle, so much. So, it's not only really the matter that the marriage is coming and we are all excited about it, but think about a marriage without any preparation. Have you been to any marriage where there's no preparation? Well, there may be such marriages, but the biblical marriage makes it very clear that this marriage is not a preparation. So, we see here very, very clearly and one of the wonderful descriptions here is very important. You know, Christ's bride, which is the church, as having made herself ready. Now, I want to draw your attention to, you know, the scripture which says here, For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And then says, And to her was granted that she may be arrayed, she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And the fine linen is a righteousness of the saints. So we see that. She made herself ready and she was dressed in the righteousness of Christ. Not the righteousness of her own. Please understand that. She did not have a righteousness of his own. Her own, sorry. But the wonderful preparation was, she was always telling yes, yes, to whom? The Holy Spirit. She was always saying yes, yes, not my own, but yours, Lord. Amen? Amen. Clothe me. Clothe me, Lord, for what I have is not of your 
your nature. Hallelujah. But what you put on is going to be the dress of the glorious bride. What a tremendous thing it is that the bride of Jesus Christ is not going to put on her own. She had made herself ready by saying yes, yes, to the Holy Spirit that she was dressed. So we see that she trusted in the Lord. She trusted in Christ. And not to have her own righteousness, but to have his righteousness put on. And then we read here, it says, for the fine linen, explaining about the dress, is the righteousness of the saints. So righteousness, one is his righteousness that is put on us when we are born again, then the righteousness that is referred to here is, if you read the Amplified, I'm not turning to different translations, he says the inwrought work of the saints. So we thank God, it's an inwrought progressive work of God in the life of the bride. Of Jesus Christ. You know, today all Christians are waiting for Christ's return, regardless of denominations. Much more the believing churches, where born again experience, salvation, baptism in water, Holy Spirit baptism and so on, and other aspects of Christian living. You know, these things are preached and taught. All of them believe. But when it comes to preparation, where is the preparation? Everybody says Christ will come tonight. Everybody says that he may come any moment. But where is the bride prepared? Nobody asks this question, whether they are leaders or saints. Everyone is living in a presumption that they are clothed. There is a readiness of the blood. There is a progressive salvation in one's life. You know, concerning a Christian marriage, You know, Charles Spurgeon once said like this, and I'm quoting him, quote, Oh, what a day that will be when the eyes of the entire universe shall be turned in one direction. And the glorious Christ, in the splendor of his manhood and his Godhead, shall take the hand of his glorious, sorry, uh, the hand of his glorious redeemed church and before men and angels and devils declare himself to be one with her forever and ever unquote. Hallelujah. What a tremendous thing. Let me say that again.
in the splendor of his manhood and his Godhead shall take the hand of his redeemed church. And before men and angels and devils declared himself to be one with her forever and ever. And I would like to say, if only our eyes could be open to see beyond see that God has a need. But blessed are those who can see the need. David, now Hannah was referring to David about David. Why God said he's a man Here stand with a burden for the Church of Jesus Christ. The bride. And this is only just a small picture of that glorious thing as Charles Spurgeon said about. Praise be to God. Oh, may God help us. I would like to move on and let's pray together. Amen. You know, let's not be in a hurry. I know. When especially in a marriage, and everybody will say, the word of God is okay, just let's finish it. You know, please, let's honor God. Everybody says marriage is honorable, but nobody honors God first of all. Only when you honor God, marriages become honorable. So may God help us. Now let's just turn to the book of Colossians today to see further something from God's word. The book of Colossians, and I'm reading a couple of scriptures, verses rather. Uh, Therefore, as the elect of God, I'm reading from verse 12. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, <clears throat> kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, 
Even as Christ forgave, so for also ye do ye. That about all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, and it's wonderful to read these verses in different translations, but for want of time, I'm not, you know, getting into other translations. There are a few things to share uh, from this scripture portion to both of you specifically, uh, dear Wellesley and Hannah, listen carefully, and all others as well. You know, we discover one of God's primary purpose in marriage in these verses. You know, God designed marriage as a living illustration of the purpose of God We see that in the word of God and we see that reflected even in these verses. In other words, I would like to say, the Lord wants you to have a marriage that would declare the full salvation of God. A marriage that would declare the purpose of God. A marriage that will show forth the great purpose of God, that is the desire of God. Now, you know, that would, you know, bring a kind of feeling within us. It's a lot, brother. It's not a small thing to declare the purpose of God. To declare the full salvation. We are just young people beginning our married life. What a great responsibility. It looks like a lot of pressure you're putting on us today. Well, I would like to say, actually speaking, it is not a pressure. That is how the natural man would look at it. It is basically just the opposite. If you take the Lord's word seriously. For example, it's a very common scripture which most of us know. Uh, Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. <laughs> Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. So, it's not a matter of pressure, it's a matter of rest. Okay, Hannah? Don't bring pressure on me. Come to him, and you will find rest. You know, Israel failed to enter into the rest. What is the rest? Accepting the will. Submitting. That's rest. Amen? So I would like to say to you, it may look, look like 
it may look like a lot of pressure. How can we, young people just beginning our married life today, that our family life is to declare the testimony of God, the purpose of God, His full salvation. I want to say, you know, it's just the opposite when we can accept that and submit ourselves, it's going to be a rest for you. Now, the Word of God very clearly tells us that His yoke is easy. Amen? And His burden is light. He doesn't lie. But somebody else lies. He does is too much, is hard. And this brother, you know that brother? That brother who lives in there. He is the hardest of them. Anybody else you can manage. So, you know, the enemy has got many, many things. So avoid that man. Avoid this man. Don't ask anybody. Do yourself. But I want to tell you, the wonderful thing is, when we seek God, that's rest. That's rest. And I would encourage you, they, it, things may look like, you know, uh, hard and difficult and we are under pressure, but I want to tell you, this is God's will for you. Amen? As I said, this is designed by God, an illustration to declare the purpose of God. You know, so we need to see that God is in it. God will lead you and guide you. Remember, uh, you know, the true word of God, the true gospel takes you away from yourself and brings you to himself. That is the true gospel. True gospel delivers you from yourself. Amen? Amen. That we do not live for your, ourselves, but unto Him. Amen? That is true salvation. Christ died for us, that now we do not live unto ourselves, but unto Him. So that is the true gospel. True gospel delivers us from ourselves and brings us to Himself. And the true gospel message or true salvation is not what you can do for him, but it's what he can do for you and in you. Amen? Amen. So that is one thing we need to recognize. I want to encourage you both, therefore. It's not a marriage of earthly blessings, therefore. It's what he can do in you. What he can do for you and in you. So it's not a marriage on earthly blessings. But on spiritual riches. The true gospel is not messages on earthly blessings. But sad to say. Today the Christian realm is filled with messages of earthly blessings. And what does that do? It takes the away from God. But the true gospel speaks about spiritual blessings. And therefore I want to say your marriage will be something of spiritual blessings. And spiritual riches to be inherited in Christ Jesus. Amen? You know, many marriages have not begun at the altar of Christ. As I shared with you yesterday when we prayed together. Many marriages have begun in themselves. Not in God. It's sad. God has brought him To approve what men have agreed. But I want to say today in the authority of God's word that true message of the gospel 
is about spiritual riches. As Paul says, writing to the Ephesians, he says to them very clearly that their eyes should be upon the spiritual riches in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 4, uh, sorry, verse 3, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You know, most of the prayers are for earthly blessings today. But not on spiritual blessings. So I want to say to both of you, be focused in your marriage. So therefore, the true gospel message is about growing into his fullness, into Christ's likeness. And we see that Christ clothed himself with all compassion, humility, gentleness, patience. And in, in his love for us, forgive us our sins by dying for us on the cross. And in our place, and how that through resurrection, he can now work in us to come into that place of sonship and fullness. So I would like to remind you again, you have heard this word. You know, Israel was delivered from Egypt. Not just that they would come out of slavery and their life in Egypt. But the promise was the great salvation, the full purpose of God. So I would like to first of all say to both of you, there is no greater example than the example of the Lord himself and his church for your married life. Please understand that. And so your marriage is an opportunity to reflect that great marriage between Christ and the church. Jesus did not come to give us better self-esteem, self-respect, and honor as a family. You know, people say, I am from that family. And Hannah is joined to that family. I am married to this family. So, I am from that family. So, we see that it's all name and honor and respect in the society. And some churches, too. They have special places for some people from some family. You know, we are living in a world today which goes by all this. And unfortunately, this virus has affected the church, churches around us. And I want to very categorically say this to both of you as young ones. Jesus did not die so that we would have, you would have wealth and prosperity. Jesus did not die. There are a lot of prosperity preachers who preach that. Sad that they don't know the scripture properly. Jesus did not die that we would have wealth and property. And not even to have a happy married life and family with children, educated, best public schools or convent schools. And if you are from Kerala, then engineer and doctor. And a nice house, they call it. I don't know what that means. You know, a nice house, uh, gated community apartments, and so on. 
This is what. Now you are married, you must have your own house. Maybe you will soon have it, that's a different question. And I want to say that Christ did not die for these things. He did not rise from the dead to give us treasures on earth. Amen? But how tempted are we? Young people jump from job to job from, from one coconut tree to another one. For 20% hike, 30% hike. Like monkeys. Many are of, you know, they don't like me because I say the truth. I'm not a great man, but... But let me tell you this honestly. He did not die for these things. He did not rise again from the dead to give us treasures on this earth. But he died and rose again to be a treasure unto us. Oh, may our eyes be open. People go crossing seas and lands for fortune today. Do not be upset with me. Somebody may ask, where are your children? Beyond the seas, right? But that does not hold me to, to speak the truth. Let me be honest, brothers and sisters. He came, died, suffered, rose again, to, not to give us treasures on this earth, but to be our treasure. Hallelujah. Blessed are you, dear Willisley and Hannah, if your eyes could be open to see this truth. God gives you a house, praise God. If God gives you a way, praise God. But your treasures are not those things that you possess. The, the, the life is not in the abundance of things that you possess, says the scripture. Not joy, Thomas. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, may God open our eyes to see. And I want to tell you, blessed are you if your eyes can be opened to see this. He died and rose again that he may be your treasure. He may be our treasure. And, and we may come into fullness of his life. For that he rose again. He came as God's son to show us who God really is. And he saved us and called us according to his purpose as we have heard so many times in the past in this body. So I would like to say your marriage is to be built on that gospel of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Not the watered down cheap gospel that people are selling on redactions and discounts. Please forgive me for using those words. But it is being done. I would encourage you, Hannah and Wellesley. Your marriage is to be built on that gospel of glory. As Paul said to the Thessalonians, you have been saved, you have been called by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of Jesus Christ. Not, your marriage is not to be built on world's ideas about marriage. Please, don't look into internet to find out what is married life. Please don't do that. Do not look into the world to get ideas about marriage. You know, in the world there are a lot of things happening today. In the world marriage is, is a matter of self-fulfillment. But in the Bible it is not that. 
people read ro you know novels romance novels and then they think about their marriage to be like that or they read somewhere or see something as war would define marriage you know it's very unfortunate that i see today so many young people getting into this mess i'm talking about believers marriage is honorable there is no honor it doesn't begin with god god is nowhere in the picture he is brought in at the last moment and today many many believers let me use this word without mincing words many believers what they do is that they mix the word and the world you understand the one else is missing in there they mix the word and the world and that's wonderful isn't it that's wonderful the bible and also something from the world now this is where i find many youngsters the other day i happened to see one live stream of a marriage it was nauseating to me there is no presence of god there is no honor to god it is very very sad to see and a young pastor was conducting that marriage whether young or old i want to tell you here we find many believers mixing the world and the word together when it comes to marriage it is going to be disastrous as far as god's purpose is concerned This is a dangerous trend that we can find today among believers. And I want to say God hates mixture. Please don't do that. I would encourage you therefore in Christ both of you. Please be open and honest with God. You know, marriage has become a time of entertainment today. There is something called pre-marriage photographs. I thought I don't think you are victims of that. Terrible things happen in pre-marriage photographs. and then on the day of marriage the pastor joins the hands before that they were holding together moving around everywhere <laughs> please let's honor god remember it originated in god amen The one who invented marriage was God himself. And therefore I want to encourage both of you Wellesley and Hannah honor God. Honor God. Don't mix the word and the world. Go by the word. Go by the altar of God. I want to encourage you So God wants you to live a life of self surrender self giving sacrificial love commitment to one another for life it's the way of the cross as we already heard from your testimonies 
there can be no oneness without the cross. I must go on quickly to share a few more things. Now I want to say to Hannah and Hannah one thing. And listen carefully, Hannah. That Willesley he is one who loves the Lord. He already shared that in testimony. And he has grown up as part of the local church in Kundra. But you know one thing? He is not Jesus. He is not perfect. He is going to let you down. If you look at that way that he is mature and he is you know he is going to make mistakes if he has not made so far he will make more mistakes in the coming days <laughs> by trying to be good to you he will make mistakes that's what I'm trying to say let's get the truth so don't look at him as he is perfect and he is being and so you know you may have a lot of expectations but let me tell you he is not Jesus Christ nor he is a mature man so you may have expectations I am not saying don't have it but remember he is immature still he is not complete yet so let's face the facts Okay? All right. You are very serious. <laughs> so let's face the facts, uh, dear Hannah. And um, he is being worked upon by the Holy Spirit as God reveals His Word, you know, in these days. So only Jesus can bring about happiness and purpose that you are looking for right so the focus is on the Lord not on him on the Lord when on the Lord then you will be able to see how God is working in him praise God right so now it is your turn Willesley <laughs> all right Hannah is an amazing personality you did not clap your hands when she testified I know you were almost there, but uh, you, you enjoyed that testimony. Maybe that testimony perhaps brought some challenges to you too. I do not know. <laughs> but I would like to say, as the word of God says, he who finds a wife finds what is good. That's what the scripture says. And receives favor from the Lord but she is not Jesus. You have found favor of God. You have found what is good. But yet again, she is not perfect. As I said a while back, she is going to show her imperfections. How hard she may work to show she is not but the imperfections will be made visible only Christ can give you the hope and purpose that you ultimately look for okay my dear brother okay. um, <clears throat> you may even think yeah my wife is an eldest daughter <laughs> for many years <laughs> wonderful thing but not perfect yet. <laughs> Alright? So please bear that in mind. I am sure you will remember my words. I am sure you will. So both of you are not to look for weaknesses in one another. If you look for, you will find plenty. And somebody else will come and show you more. I don't want to name him. And include him in my agenda. So please remember this. That... We are being worked upon, you are being worked upon, 
and your focus is on the Lord. That should not be lost. So, you know, when you look upon or when we look upon our spouses with great expectations, remember one thing, only Jesus Christ can fulfill those expectations, not they. When they are open, God will work and those changes will come. You know, then we will have enough room to accept failures as we read in Colossians. To put on the Christ nature. Accept failures, mistakes, limitations and room for changes in one another. One thing marriage does is it shows your faults. Okay, let's sleep. That's why I said today morning itself. <laughs> uh, right? So, <laughs> you know, marriage uh, shows us our weaknesses. Your weaknesses, your selfish tendencies. It exposes one's self-life. Remember, many other things may not, but marriage exposes self-life. The little parts of your life that you could hide all the years from everyone will be now exposed. You want to get in? <laughs> You cannot get out, you already promised. <laughs> All right, now this is a reality. Please understand this. The little parts of you that you could hide all these years from everyone else, except now you will expose it. You know, it will be exposed to your spouse. As you struggle, as two imperfect human beings, two imperfect human beings called to be perfect. Amen? Trying to marriage work. One thing will happen to you and that is your dependency on God. Amen? Not in yourself. Your dependency is on... That's why I said... We are going to center on Christ. Our center is Christ himself. So, we, you will discover it more and more as the days go by. Yes. Your dependency on God would be the success of your marriage. God's word clearly tells us that we are being changed and we are being saved. Amen. We have been listening this for many weeks, for many months. So there is no place for self-condemnation. The scripture also declares us that marriage is a lifelong commitment. Jesus said that nothing can separate us from the love of God. If Jesus has promised that, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. And that he will never break his covenant with us. Then he expects that we do not do the same with our marriage covenant. Okay. He will not break his covenant with us. We are also not to break our covenant with one another. Which soon you will make in the presence of God. In the light of this word. The second thing I want to share from Colossians 3 is, um, as we read here, <clears throat> very clearly it says that forbearing one another, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bubbles of mercies, kindness, humbleness of heart, meekness, long-suffering, Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. We, you are called 
to show forth the message of Christ. The word of God has to dwell in you richly. Verse 16 says, let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, and it goes on. Teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, and it goes on. And whatsoever ye do in the word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God dwell in you richly. You change and grow as you are shaped by the Holy Spirit. You are a work in progress, both of you. You are a work in progress. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God changes you and you grow as individuals together into the great purpose of God. You know, in these verses here, verse 13, we read, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. In other words, there are so many one another in the Bible. I want to bring your notice to that. Love one another, encourage one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, be patient with one another, prefer one another, be devoted to one another, don't judge one another. There are about 59 one another's in the Bible. Can you imagine? One another commandments or commands in the New Testament. In other words, the Lord is telling you both today, I'm putting you both into marriage that you may practice this one another. Marriage is an institution where this one another is being practiced. Love one another. Forgive one another. Speak truth to one another. <laughs> Encourage one another. Admonish one another. Exhort one another. So it goes on. You know, so your married life has to be built upon this principle in God's word. Your home is going to be a one another training facility. Whether you like it or not. You know, that's what Colossians also tells us very clearly. So this passage gives us a two-step process. In his workings. First, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Number one. Let it take up residence in you. Become part of you. Okay. Then you are ready for the next step. What is the next step? You know, that is, let it flow out of you into the life, you know, to one another's life. So when the word of God richly dwell in all wisdom, then teaching admonition, all this will happen. Amen? So first is the word of God richly dwell in us. But many a time we don't want the word, but we want to admonish one another, correct one another. But let the word richly dwell in you. Then you are ready for the second part of it. It will flow from life in forms of admonition, encouragement, and in many ways. It's like, you know, you fill a water, you know, a little uh, glass with a water, it overflows. 
you know, as word comes in, it richly dwells, it then will begin to flow out and help the other to be encouraged, to be admonished. You know, that's very important. It speaks of your personal devotional life. Let the word of God richly dwell in you. Amen? Now that is your responsibility. The more you have, the more you will have to offer to others. If you don't have, then you don't have anything to offer. It speaks about your devotional life. And this is important, Wellesley and also Hannah. I want to encourage both of you. Please be serious about your devotional life. So I want to say, use your printed Bibles. I'm coming back to that. Please use your printed Bibles. Write down, underline. I want to tell you, I remember I had kept all my Bibles from the time I was born again. I underlined them. I had written down what I spoke. God spoke to me. His promises. It's, it's what a refreshing thing to go through that again. But one plea is that don't depend upon WhatsApp University. You know WhatsApp University? You don't know. WhatsApp. This is WhatsApp University. Nothing remains. Nothing remains. And I would like to say to you, devotion with God, time with God. You're listening, it may be online or other devotion, but keep the Bible open. Keep the Bible open. Right now. You can go back there. Abhi naya phone ho gaya to purana chala gaya. WhatsApp university is gone. I would encourage you. Devotional life. Let the word of God richly dwell in you. That is both hearing and obeying. I want to tell you. And then it says, you know, um, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. S teaching and admonishing one another, again, is two-way street. It's not one-way traffic. It's a two-way traffic. It involves... The one who teaches also to be one who is being taught. Amen? That's very important. In the best posture that Wellesley and Hannah, both of you can take as a husband or a wife, is that of a learner who is willing to learn from the Lord. Who is able to learn and also listen to one another. And it's wonderful to see here, look at this scripture, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms. How do you admonish somebody through psalms? Some people admonish one another through raising voices, shouting. Yes or no? Huh? That is how many people admonish by shouting and raising voices. But here it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns. There's something new, isn't it? Some people admonish one another with the Bible hitting on the head. Very spiritual admonition. <laughs> but here 
hear the admonition and teaching is through psalms and hymns. What does that really mean? It's difficult to understand. In other words, what it says is that it's through our time of worship. Amen? Our time with God. Our time in prayer, our drawing together unto the Lord. Amen. You know, by spending time with the Lord individually and corporately together as, as a family, and individually your devotional time, right? And you're worshiping the Lord alone and together, those times of your sins, I want to tell you, admonitions and corrections and all these things are going to happen. It's going to be a new way. I don't think you have heard this before. May God open our eyes to see that. How amazing to think that our greatest teaching tool is much more than words. Our teaching tool, admonition tool is going to be even our worship and our adoration of the Lord. And I want to tell you both even today, when you will open up your lives for God's workings in your life, by drawing closer to the Lord, a great work will be accomplished in you. That is from where all kinds of corrections and teachings will come into your life. So I want to encourage you about it. Something I have never shared before, but God has helped me to see this truth anew and afresh in these days. But I also want to tell you that when you are pursuing God's purpose in these end times, you will face many, many trials and sufferings for His name's sake. But remember, in the midst of all that, God will be with you. I'm, I must go on quickly. But your source of strength in such times will be looking unto God, who is your anchor and your anchorage. Keep singing, keep seeking the Lord in worship, in adoration, amen? And there you will find these things flowing into your life. And finally, I would like to share this with us in the light of first, uh, sorry, Colossians chapter 3. Um, as we read it, and whatever you do, whether in word, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father. Whatever you do in deed, everything, everything in action, everything in word, do all it in the name of the Lord. In other words, it should be for the glory of God. That's one thing I would like to say. That means... Keeping God really at the center in your married life. Cherishing God, making God the center at all times. Valuing the glory of God above all things, including your spouse. Amen. God above. Above all things, including your wife, including your husband. God is above. Now that's very important. Only then you can live under the glory of God. Your identity is not that you are somebody else's spouse but your identity is primarily you are the child of God. Amen? That is your primary identity. That you are the disciple of Jesus Christ. This may sound very strange to some but it's a healthy, a healthy marriage is not about putting your spouse first or your wife or husband first but putting Christ first and one another second. And this is the best thing that you can do to one another. 
if you put one another first then you make your spouse an idol it amounts to idolatry God must be first and make sure that you do not make anyone else other than Jesus your first priority these are some of the few things I want to say share with you in closing so the key to God glorifying marriage is superior satisfaction in God alone above all things including each other that is going to be the greatest joy of your marriage and Willesley I want to say to you don't think your love for Hannah or Hannah don't think that your love for Willesley will glorify God until it flows from a heart that delights in God first. Amen? You understood that? I'll say that again. It looks like everyone is getting tired except the preacher. Alright. Alright. Praise God. It happens. So let us see, don't think that your love for Hannah or Hannah, don't think that your love for Wellesley will glorify God. If I love him, God will be glorified. If I love her, God is going to do it. No. And it flows from a heart that delights in God more than the delights in one another. Okay. So it's God first. Your love for the Lord must be steadfast. And that is how God will be glorified in your man's life. As I have shared before, you know, it's like a triangle. God, Wellesley, Hannah. You know, a triangle, God, Wellesley, Hannah. You want to come, you come closer to God, you come closer to one another. Amen? You come like this, then what happens? <laughs> so you have to come like this. That is where you will be centered in Christ and come to him. Closer to one another. God's love and his, his care over your marriage will continue to flourish day after day as you keep him first. The other thing I want to quickly share before I close is, you know, it says in verse uh, 18, wives submit unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands love your wives. And this is a very important subject we have heard many number of times. You know, and um, it says, wives submitting to your husbands and husbands loving your own wives. You know, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Some people think that this is an outmoded thing. It is not for today. But I want to say to you quickly one thing here. You know, when it says, submit to your own husbands, it is an invitation, Hannah, to display the kingdom of God. Okay? It is an invitation to display the kingdom of God and the government of God. It's a call to walk like Jesus. Amen? Hannah, always remind this. You remind yourself about this. Submission is not an outmoded word, you know, uh, by men who talk about male dominance and all that stuff. But remember that it's an invitation to display the kingdom of God and the government of God. It is a call 
to look uh, uh, to the Lord and display also the governmental principles upon this earth. All right? You know the government of God. God, Christ, man, woman. All right? So this is very important. The government of God. I'm not taking time to explain you. I've heard that of me several times in the past. And I would like to also say to um, dear brother, uh, Jesus displays his headship to the church by loving her. Husbands, love your wives. So it speaks about the headship of Christ over the church but he displays that by not by dominance but by loving her by sacrificial love unto the church so that is the true biblical headship you know that that's what in in short i want to say you heard about it more uh, in the previous uh, marriages and also in the body of christ both the husband, the head, and the wife submitting are playing the role of Jesus. When you love and she submits, both of you are taking the role of Christ. You have heard this before. Though Jesus was equal with God, he humbled himself, took the form of man, and suffered. Amen. So, Christ submit to the Father. Son unto the Father. Right? So, in both, you are displaying, you know, the, the life of Christ. So, I want to encourage you, as the scripture says, these words are going to help you to really glorify God in your marriage. You know, it's... It's very sad today. The world does not fully understand marriage because it does not understand the word of God. The world does not understand submission and sacrificial love because it does not understand the love of Jesus Christ, the love for his bride, the church. It is a rare and a so, uh, 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 and a beautiful message to the world but somehow those who are to reflect that they are not seen today God's true people the, the, the Christians are supposed to reflect it but unfortunately Christians have failed today so two people today you are committing yourself to display this glorious message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? What a challenge it is. It is, it is it's a full-time ministry. You know that? Don't resign your jobs for that. You are getting into a tremendous ministry and call to reflect the glory, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to a world which is lost and sad to say, even a Christian world, you know, today, that is not seen at all around us. But I would encourage both of you to submit yourself to the plan of God. And finally, finally, I would like to say, Wellesley and Hannah, I know that the desire of our, your hearts is also that God may be glorified. Amen? Amen? Be true to that. And God will never fail you. Amen? That is God's word. Anything you do in deeds or words, do it all to the glory of God. You know, and God will not let you down. That is your desire, that you want to be part of his glorious bride on his arrival, coming, right? Yes. What an incredible and amazing and beautiful thing, therefore, marriage is. 
Today people want to run into Gelit and Mahaj and get out of Mahaj in three months. Believers and pastors are willing to collect their marriages again. The Bible says God hates marriage. Remarriage. Divorce and remarriage. God hates it. God hates divorce, the scripture says. God hates. But where are those who preach this and teach this and practice this? I want to encourage you, therefore, in the love of Christ. What an incredible and amazing, beautiful thing, therefore, marriage is in the sight of God, unto which you are going to enter in, into a covenant with God and with one another. Amen? It's not before men. It's first before God and to one another. I'm going to use some specific words in closing. No wonder God takes it so seriously and expects us to do the same. Amen. I hope you don't enter into marriage today in any other way. Or with the ideas of the world somewhere in your mind. Let all such ideas you had maybe till now be cleansed and washed by the water of the word you have received today. Amen. May God's word do that. Your vows and covenants which you will make in a few moments that you make to God and to one another may have the seal of the word and the Holy Spirit. By the grace of God, your marriage is meant to be the best echo, the most beautiful reflection, the most beautiful faith uh, or most, most faithful reflection of the re relationship between Jesus and his church. It is about being genuinely united in a strong godly intimate relationship that echoes the one relationship between Christ and the church. Amen. Amen. May God help. Please give yourself to this great call to reflect God's purpose and His glorious gospel. Amen. Let's look at the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your great mercies upon us, Lord. Thank you for your word that you have spoken, O God, unto all of us. Lord, we thank you for your divine counsels of God which you have sent unto us and especially to our dear brother and sister. Lord, it's our prayer, O oh God, that your word will richly dwell in them and in us. Lord, today marriage has become many things to many people. But you designed it for your own glory and for the welfare of mankind. Father, we pray and commit our lives unto you, Lord. We thank you for the day of your return is coming. It's approaching so soon, O Lord. And we thank you for 
that day when your bride will be ready. She will put on those garments, Lord, that you will provide for her. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Shall be those garments which you will provide for her. We thank you, Father. Lord, once again at this time, we come into all those who are married here. Father, we thank you for giving us an opportunity to hear about the purpose of our married life. Cleanse us and wash us by your word of God. Correct us, change us. And now specifically we pray for Wellesley and Hannah, Lord. We commit them into thy faithful hands. Oh God, we pray that they may be cleansed and washed from every other attitudes and Lord, from every other thoughts that they had about. That there be no mixture in them, Lord. Yes, they would know that their marriage is a beautiful, amazing opportunity to declare your kingdom, to display your kingdom, your purpose upon this earth. Lord Jesus, Help them to take this challenge. Do it all to the glory of God, Father. Bless their marriage to that. And it's our prayer. And we pray, O oh God, as they move into the time of making covenants and commitments. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will seal it by thy word of God. Yes, so help them and lead them. Now, Lord, we commit everything into thy faithful hands. Lead and guide us as, Lord, these two lives will now come forward to make their covenants. Once again, we thank you, Father, we bless you, give you the glory and praise. In Jesus' most precious and matchless name we pray.